Hello everyone, this is Dr. Lyons again, uh, and in this particular video, we're going to be going into the first part of Chapter 8. Uh, chapter 8 is a chapter that is all about marine fishes, uh, and since it's a pretty big chapter, I've broken it in two. Uh, in the first part, we'll be talking about groups of marine fishes. Uh, so there's three different groups that I want to discuss. And then in the second part of this chapter, then we'll be talking more about what it's like to be a fish in the ocean. And we'll talk about some of the challenges that fishes face in the ocean. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to try to think about some characteristics that would describe fishes. So obviously you can't turn to your table mate unless you happen to be watching this video with, with a buddy. Uh, but even if you're not with a buddy, I want you to pause it and think for a second about some characteristics that might describe fishes. Uh, and you can see in this picture, this is what's known as a permit, which is obviously a type of fish. You know, think about the things that this fish has that makes it a fish. So there's a few different things that, that distinguish a fish from some of the other groups of animals that we've been talking about. Uh, for instance, uh, all the animals that we've talked about up until now were invertebrates, right? So things that don't have a backbone. Whereas marine fishes are things that are vertebrates. So these do have a, ver a vertebral column, uh, what we call a spine, uh, that's made out of either bone or cartilage. Uh, in the, the vertebrae, those are the individual bones that make up the vertebral column. Uh, and they, they have two really important features. So they, they protect the spinal cord uh, and, they, uh, and they also give some support to the fish. It's like a long, hard rod that gives support to the fish. It basically does the same stuff that our backbone does for us, right? If, uh, if you didn't have a backbone, it would be hard for you to stand upright uh, and you would have nothing to protect your very, very important spinal cord, which is part of our nervous system. Okay, all fishes have a brain. Uh, so they have a centralized nervous system and that brain is protected by a hardened skull. Uh, so that is something that uh, fishes have that the other animals we've talked about so far do not have. They all have an endoskeleton, uh, endo meaning inside. Uh, that's in contrast with something like, say, a crab, which has an exoskeleton, a hard skeleton on the outside. With marine fishes, they're like us. They have a hard skeleton on the inside uh, made of either bone or cartilage, depending on what type of fish we're talking about. Uh, all fishes have gill slits. So these are, are kind of holes in the side of a fish, typically right behind the head, uh, which water can pass through that goes through the, the gills that allow them to breathe. All marine fishes are bilateral, so they are like us. They have a left and a, and a right side. Uh, and importantly to the evolution of vertebrates, these are the oldest and the largest group of vertebrates, right? So things with backbones, it started with the fishes. Uh, and then from fishes came amphibians, from amphibians came reptiles, and from reptiles came the birds and the mammals. So our ancestors are fishes. If you go back far enough in time, uh, your great, 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 great times millions, uh, your great, great, great grandfather would have been a fish. So we're going to talk about three different groups of, of fishes. Uh, uh, so we're going to talk about these things up here. These are what are known as the agnatha, uh, which translates to the jawless fishes. So these are the oldest varieties of fishes. Uh, then we'll talk about the chondrichthys, which are known as the cartilaginous fishes. Uh, they kind of evolve next. Uh, and then the most recent group of fishes to evolve are the osteichthys, what are known as the bony fishes. Uh, so we'll talk about each of these three different groups of fishes. Uh, and then there is this other group known as the cephalochordates, which are these really small kind of fish-like things. Uh, they don't actually have a backbone, but they have a notochord, uh, which is kind of like a backbone. So they are a pretty close relative of all these things that do have backbones. So like I said before, we'll talk about the jawless fishes first, then we'll go on to the cartilaginous fishes, and then finally the bony fishes. So first, the, the fishes that don't have any jaws. Uh, so the, the word agnatha literally means no mouth. So when you put the, the letter A in front of a word, it modifies that word to mean uh, without that thing. 
So something that is abnormal does not have any normality to it. It's not a normal thing. Uh, and natha means mouth, so they have no mouth, which is, isn't to say that they don't have any sort of mouth. Uh, it's just that they don't have a hinged jaw like we do. Uh, so your mouth uh, has a, a lower jaw, which connects to the rest of your skull, and you can move your jaw up and down, right? And that's how you, you chew on food. Uh, these guys don't have that. Uh, what they have instead is kind of a circular mouth with rows of teeth that kind of face inward. Uh, so they, they eat their food in a very different way. Kind of what they do is they kind of suck onto their food and they kind of spin their bodies around in order to, to tear chunks of flesh off of whatever it is they're eating. So uh, both groups of, of, of the Agnatha, both the lampreys and the hagfishes are obviously uh, eel-like, as you can see in the pictures. Uh, they don't have any paired fins. Well, we'll see when we get to some of the other groups of fishes that they will have pairs of fins, one on the left and one on the right. Uh, these don't have those. They only have fins on the top and the bottom. Uh, unlike the other fishes we'll talk about, they also don't have scales. Uh, which is why these tend to have a very slimy kind of texture uh, outside of them. Uh, and they don't have a skeleton made of bone. Their skeleton is completely made of cartilage. Uh, and so you're probably aware of some places in your body where you have cartilage. So for instance, between all of your vertebrae, there is cartilage. Uh, between the, the bones in your knee, there's cartilage. Your ears are cartilage. Your nose is made of cartilage. So we do have cartilage in our skeleton, uh, but we also have bone in our skeleton. Uh, whereas these things, the agnatha, their skeleton is completely made of cartilage. There's no hard bone uh, inside of it. Uh, so that's another important distinction between them and the other groups of fishes that we'll talk about. So the jawless fishes include, uh, include these two groups. They include the, the hagfishes and the lampreys. So hagfishes, which you see down here, uh, they are only found in the ocean, and they tend to be in really deep water where they feed on the corpses of dead things that sink down. So for instance, if you were to find uh, a whale on the bottom of the seafloor, you would definitely find some hagfishes kind of roaming around the whale and eating it. So they are scavengers, essentially. Uh, lampreys, on the other hand, they are mostly freshwater, although there are some saltwater lampreys. Uh, and what they do is they ectoparasitize other things. So ecto meaning outside and parasite meaning a small thing that eats a larger thing. You can see on this trout right here, these dark black things, those are lampreys. Uh, and what those lampreys are doing is they're latched onto the outside of this fish and they are eating its scales, eating its tissue, eating its blood. And how they do so is with their circular mouth that you see right there. Right, so I talked about how these things don't have a jaw. They don't have a, a hinged jaw, that is. But what you see there is a set of circular teeth that are all facing in. Uh, and what they do is they just kind of suck onto either uh, a fish in the case of a lamprey or say a whale carcass in the case of a hagfish. And they just kind of twist their bodies and these teeth that are facing in will, will cut off bits of flesh as they twist their bodies around. Okay, so those are the, the agnatha. Now let's talk about the cartilaginous fishes, which are known as the chondrichthys. Uh, in this word, chondrichthys literally translates to cartilaginous fish. Uh, so the prefix here, uh, chondra, that refers to cartilage, and ichthys refers to fishes. So for instance, a, per a person that is an ichthyologist is a person that studies fishes. Uh, and so cartilaginous fishes include sharks, it includes rays, it includes skates, uh, and it includes this really weird group of fishes known as the rat fishes. So you can probably guess what the skeleton of these are made out of. Uh, it's made out of cartilage, which is why we call them the cartilaginous fishes. Uh, but don't forget that, that lampreys and hagfish, the ignatha, they also have a cartilaginous skeleton. Uh, but unlike the ignatha, cartilaginous fishes have a hinged jaw, right? So they have a lower jaw that can move up and down that they can use for, for tearing bits of, of flesh off of whatever it is they're eating. Uh, and these things feed in three major ways. They are either carnivores, so meaning that they, they hunt and kill live things, live animals that is. Uh, some are scavengers, uh, and there are some that are filter feeders. Uh, I'll talk about those in a, in a little bit. So this is a uh, what's known as an oceanic manta ray. Uh, this is actually a filter feeder, which I'll explain more about in a, in a minute. 
This is what's known as a wobegong shark. Uh, so, so this is kind of the mouth of the shark. Uh, these are the eyes of it. Uh, these are two things known as spiracles, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, and they just kind of hide on the seafloor and wait for things to swim close enough to their mouths for them to eat. So let's talk a little bit about what makes a, uh, a cartilaginous fish a cartilaginous fish. So they have five to seven gill slits, uh, and you can see those there on the side of this, uh, this shark diagram right there. So one, two, three, four, five. Uh, some sharks do have actually more than seven. Uh, for instance, there's something known as a nine gilled shark. Uh, but essentially, they have seven gill slits, but just a couple of the gill slits have multiple openings to them. Uh, all of the cartilaginous fishes have something known as a spiracle. Uh, and this is essentially, it's kind of like a nostril in a way, right? So this hole behind the eye of this shark, uh, that is its spiracle. Uh, and essentially, that opens up into the mouth, uh, and it allows the, or, or into the mouth cavity, and it allows this shark to breathe without opening its mouth. Kind of in the same way that you can breathe without opening your mouth by opening your nostrils, they can do the same uh, by, by breathing through their spiracles. So this is particularly useful to, to sharks and rays and skates that live on the sea floor, uh, whose mouth is actually closed by the sea floor beneath them. So that Wobegon shark, for instance, uh, it definitely uses its spiracles for breathing. Sharks have a particular type of scale that is a little bit different from those of other uh, fishes. So sharks have what are known as placoid scales. Um, and I'm sorry, not just sharks, but all cartilaginous fishes have what's known as a placoid scale. Versus bony fishes, which we'll get to in a little bit, they have what's known as a tenoid or cycloid scale. So first let's talk about placoid scales for a minute. Uh, so the, the first part of the word placoid is plaque. Uh, and that should make you think of the thing that you don't want on your teeth, right? So those hard plates that, that form on your teeth if you don't, if you don't brush them enough. Uh, so that's what plaque is. So plaque refers to a hard plate, something kind of related to teeth. So the placoid scales of a cartilaginous fish are kind of like tiny little bits of teeth. And you can see that here, they look like little teeth. Uh, and all those teeth you'll notice are all facing in one direction. Uh, so think for a second, uh, with this picture, in which direction would you guess the head of the shark would be? So if you guessed to the left, then you're right. Uh, the head of the shark would be over here, the tail would be over there. So as the shark moves through the water this direction, the water flows over those teeth, over those placoid scales, uh, and that reduces drag. Over here you see what are known as tenoid scales of a, of a bony fish. Uh, the prefix teen refers to combs. Remember, we talked about the tina fours, which were those things that are like a jellyfish but don't sting, but have those little comb-like things in them. So tenoid scales refer to these scales that have these little teeth, uh, these little combs at the, at the end of them. Uh, so that's what a, what a tenoid scale looks like. Uh, one important thing I want to bring up is about sandpaper. Uh, so the, the, the skin of a, of a shark or any cartilaginous fish feels really rough if you rub your hand in one direction. So if you were to rub your hand along this shark's skin in this direction, it would feel really rough because you have all these little teeth all facing that way. So in the olden days, before there was, there was commercial paper uh, style sandpaper, uh, people used to use the skin of sharks actually in order to sand pieces of wood. So sharks uh, in cartilaginous fishes, for that matter, are very, very diverse. So there are enormous sharks, there are tiny sharks, there's sharks and rays and skates of all different shapes and sizes living in all different types of habitats, which in a way kind of makes sense because this group, the cartilaginous fishes, have been around for a very, very long time. Uh, and so as a result, there's been a, a huge amount of time for them to, uh, for them to proliferate. Uh, inform new and newer and newer species. So let's talk a little bit about what makes a shark a shark. So first of all, our sh all sharks have two dorsal fins, which you can see here and there. Uh, they all have three sets of ventral fins. So we have pectoral fins, which are paired. So there's one on one side and one on the other. They have two pelvic fins, you know, one on each side, uh, and then one anal fin. Uh, and then all sharks have what's known as a heterocircle caudal fin. 
So the caudal fin, which, which you would also maybe call the tail fin. Uh, on sharks, this is what's known as being heterocircal. Uh, and why it is called that is because the prefix hetero means different. If you look at this fin, the top part is different from the lower part. Right, so the two different parts of the fin are, are se or not separate, but different from each other. So heterocircle means different shapes of the two parts of the, of the tail. Uh, and on some sharks, this is really, uh, really uh, accentuated. So there's a type of shark called a, a thresher shark that has a super long upper lobe of its tail that it uses for kind of swatting at prey fish that it tries to eat. So the upper lobe of its tail can be close to half the total length of the shark. Uh, so it's got this super long uh, upper lobe of its tail. Some sharks uh, are actually filter feeders. And uh, in, in we learned that filter feeding means an organism that pumps water through uh, some mouth or mouth-like thing. Uh, and then there is a screen that gets small bits of food off of that screen uh, and, and traps those so that those can be eaten. Uh, and that's what both whale sharks and basking sharks do. Uh, so they use what are known as their gill rakers. Uh, gill rakers are these kind of comb-like things that you see there attached to their gills. Uh, and what those gill rakers do uh, is they filter water. So they, they trap any small bits of food that are in the water. So these two sharks, when you see them, they'll just be swimming around with their mouths open, essentially trapping small particles that are, that are in, the, in the water. Uh, and there are actually places where you can see whale sharks not too far from Los Angeles. Uh, so down in the Sea of Cortez in, in Mexico, uh, there is, uh, there's some places in the Sea of Cortez where whale sharks will congregate, where you can actually go and swim with them. Uh, this is something that, that I did a couple years ago in the, in the town of La Paz uh, in, in Baja. Uh, you can actually go and swim with whale sharks that congregate there every year. Uh, and they, and which is a pretty exciting experience because they are the biggest fish in the ocean. So adult whale sharks can get to be something like 40 or 50 feet long. Uh, the ones that I swam with weren't quite as big, maybe on the order of 30 feet long, but still swimming alongside a 30 foot long fish is a pretty, pretty exciting experience. The, with sharks, how they reproduce is pretty crazy. Uh, it's crazy in that they do it in a lot of different ways. So there are some sharks that are what are known as being oviparous, meaning that they lay egg cases. Uh, and if you've ever seen something like this on a beach, what you found was actually the, the egg case of a shark. Uh, so that's being oviparous, kind of like a chicken is oviparous. It lays eggs. Then there's something known as ovoviviparous. Uh, and so that is laying eggs, but still also having an ovary, having a, a uterus. So what goes on with that is that there are eggs, but they are inside the uterus of the female shark. Uh, and those eggs hatch inside the, of the female's uterus. So the egg never actually leaves the, the female. It stays right inside of the female. So that is being ovoviviparous. Uh, and then finally, there are some sharks that do it like us. There are some sharks that have vivipary. Uh, they are viviparous, meaning that they have live birth. Right, so just like us humans, uh, we don't lay eggs, obviously, uh, or at least if you are laying eggs, you're not doing it how most other people do it. Uh, but again, you know, but no judgment if you like to lay eggs. Uh, but most of us don't lay eggs, uh, and we have live birth instead. So a whole live human emerges from a female human, uh, and that's what's known as live birth. And that's what you see here. A whole live shark is emerging from this, this female shark right here. So that's viviparous. Uh, so uh, one important thing to note is that it's not as if a shark can decide, oh, I want to be oviparous today, and then tomorrow they might decide, oh, I want to be viviparous. No, it, the different species do it different ways. So some species are oviparous, some species are ovoviviparous, and other species are viviparous. Uh, so that's uh, what I mean by all this. Okay, one really important thing about sharks uh, is that they maintain the role of the apex predator in, in the areas that they live. Uh, and apex predators can have a really big effect on the functioning of an entire ecosystem. So let's think about this, this food web that I've, that I've drawn here. So we have sharks eat middle predators, 
Middle predators eat herbivores. Herbivores eat algae, so seaweeds. And seaweeds compete with coral for space on the seafloor. Uh, and in this competition, in this fight between algae and corals, we really want the corals to win because the corals are what actually make the seafloor available for other things to live inside of. Right? Corals make a coral reef. Uh, you can't have a, you don't have algae reefs, but you do have coral reefs, which things live in. So let's think about what happens when sharks are around, right? So when there's a lot of sharks present, think about it, what's going to happen to the abundance of the middle predators? Uh, and then when that changes the abundance of the middle predators, what will that effect will that have on the herbivores and then on the algae and on the corals? The overall effect is that when there are a lot of sharks around, you don't see a lot of these middle predators. Uh, and because there's not a lot of these middle predators, you have lots and lots of these herbivores. And those herbivores eat all of the algae. So there's very little algae on the reef. And instead the reef is dominated by corals. So that is what a, a healthy coral reef looks like. Uh, by having those large predatory sharks, they control the middle predators, which gives the herbivores a chance to remove the algae from the reef. Now see what happens when you lose sharks from a particular area, right? So now the sharks are gone, you know, think about what effect that will have on the middle predators and what effect that will have on the herbivores and then finally on the algae and on the coral. What you tend to see is lots and lots of these middle predators uh, in the area when you, when you lose sharks. As a result, you see very few herbivores and as a, and as a result, the algae goes kind of out of control. Uh, it grows out of control and it will tend to smother the, the corals. So that's why sharks are so important, uh, because they can have a really big effect on the whole ecosystem. Uh, and I have been scuba diving in places with sharks and places without sharks. Uh, and one definitely notices a difference. When there aren't any sharks, you see tons and tons of these middle predators uh, and very few herbivores and a lot of algae. In places where you do see sharks, you know, way, way fewer of these. Uh, you see a lot of herbivores, and as a result, you see lots of coral because all the algae is being removed by those herbivores. So that's kind of linked with uh, a problem that we have worldwide uh, in that most species of sharks have been declining. Uh, the reason is because of overfishing. So these are some figures from a, a paper published in 2007. Uh, and it is showing the abundance of different types of sharks from the 70s up through the, the 2000s. And you can see the, the, the overwhelming trend uh, is that there's been a decline. There are way, few shark, way fewer sharks in the ocean than there was back in the 70s and going before that. Uh, and the reason is that we're catching too many of them. Uh, and a particularly insidious form of catching too many sharks uh, results in something that you see here. So these are a bunch of shark fins. Uh, you may have heard of the practice of shark fin of shark finning in the production of shark fin soup. So shark fin soup is a is a delicacy in certain Asian countries. Uh, it is a very expensive dish that is that is purchased in a in a sort of way of showing one's prominence and wealth. Uh, but the, the really sad part of it uh, is that all of the sharks that were once connected to these fins, the rest of the shark wasn't even uh, consumed. It was just dumped over the side of the, of the boat. So it's kind of a barbaric thing. Uh, sharks are caught, the fins are removed from the sharks, and then the shark is just dumped back in the ocean and, and not even consumed uh, by, the, by the people that are, that are taking the fins. Uh, fortunately, a lot of shark finning has, has decreased uh, uh, globally, because there's been more and more countries where there are sharks have realized that the practice is not only barbaric, but also uh, really bad for the populations of sharks. And as we discussed a minute ago, sharks are really, really important to ecosystems. So shark finning isn't quite as much of an issue uh, now as it was in the past, but there is still lots and lots of fishing of sharks going on in the ocean. And there's still shark finning going on in the ocean, which is really unfortunate. Uh, this, the fact that we're catching too many sharks is, is not helped by the fact that sharks in general have a poor public perception, right? So the, so since the, the first, you know, first shark movie Jaws came out, 
uh, people have kind of started to view sharks as being this dangerous thing that, that we don't necessarily want to have in the ocean because sometimes they occasionally eat and kill people. Uh, however, uh, not a lot of people are sh actually killed by sharks per year. Uh, so this is showing the amount of shark attacks globally. Uh, the red ones are fatal and the blue ones are non-fatal. So if we hone in on the fatal ones, like these things here, uh, what you see is there's sam somewhere on the order of between like one in 10 fatal shark attacks per year. So it's actually a, a very, very small a number of people actually do get killed by sharks. Uh, we talked about, about box jellyfish and about how the Aux Australian box jellyfish kills as many as 100 people per year, whereas all of the various types of sharks only kill something like 10 people per year. So there's a, a lot of poor public perception of sharks, but a lot of it is really not warranted because they're really not a major threat to the two people. Uh, even people that spend a lot of time in the ocean, such as myself, uh, there's even even though I spend a lot of time surfing and scuba diving and being in the ocean, there's still very a very 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 small chance of me ever encountering a shark in a in a negative way. Uh, in fact, I've been around many many sharks while scuba diving, and in general, they just kind of stay away from you. Uh, it's very very rare for sharks to actually uh, attack people. So a lot of people will ask me if, I, if I'm afraid of sharks and if I'm afraid to be in the water when I see sharks, like when I'm surfing and such. Uh, and my answer to that is always uh, that I'm much more fearful of dying in a car accident on the way to the beach to go surfing. Because really, at the end of the day, uh, when a person goes surfing a lot like I do, uh, I'm way more likely to die in a car wreck while driving to the beach than I am to die in the mouth of a shark while surfing. Uh, so we really have to think about the, the numbers. Sharks really are not a major, uh, a major threat to us. Uh, really, crashing and dying in cars is much more of a major threat to us. So a few years ago, uh, when I was living in the Caribbean, uh, because I love sharks so much and, and because me and others feel like we've got to change the public perception of sharks, uh, I, I, me and some friends, we made a program for the kids on the island uh, to help them uh, realize, you know, how important sharks are, and to help them to to love sharks. Uh, so that's what we what we did there. So the next group of fishes that I want to talk about, uh, or the next group of cartilaginous fishes I want to talk about, are the rays and the skates. So these are the things that, in general, tend to be either hiding in the hiding on the bottom or roaming around in the open ocean. So something like this uh, stingray obviously hides on the bottom most of the time, uh, and something like this oceanic manta ray uh, tends to swim around uh, over broad areas. These things are either carnivores or filter feeders. So a stingray will eat small things like crabs and clams and mussels and things like that off of the seafloor. Whereas this giant ocean going manta ray, you can see it's got its mouth wide open. It uses its gill rakers to feed, just like a whale shark or, or a basking shark does. So some of these things have barbs. Uh, and probably a lot of you, probably for a lot of you, that makes you think of Steve Irwin. So he was the, the, uh, the crocodile guy from Australia, uh, died in a very tragic, uh, very freak uh, accident with a stingray. Uh, essentially, the stingray stabbed him with its, uh, with its barb. Uh, that is a pretty rare thing to, to happen, to actually get stabbed by a, a stingray. Uh, and unfortunately for Steve Irwin, the barb had happened to go right into his heart. Uh, so in general, you can't survive it when things stab you in the, in the heart. And that, unfortunately, was what happened to, to him. Uh, so all of the rays, uh, they give birth to live young. Uh, so baby, a baby ray will come out of its mom. Uh, that's in contrast with the skates. Uh, so the skates, they don't have barbs like a stingray does. Uh, and instead of having live birth, they lay eggs. Uh, and so probably a lot of you have seen these at the beach. Uh, these are commonly called mermaids purses, I believe. Uh, and these are actually the egg case of a skate. So if you found one of these, you found where a, a little baby skate had, had been. Uh, and, and we have a lot of skates in, in uh, California at the sandy beaches. Uh, in fact, I've interacted with these quite a few times, not always, not always in a good way. 
uh, because even though these don't have barbs, they do have tiny little spines on their uh, on their 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 kind of back protrusion here. Uh, and those little spines uh, are painful if they if they stab you with one of them. Uh, and so I've I've had a couple of times where I've stepped too close to one of them, not knowing they were there, and gotten stabbed by one of these. And it, and it's it, you bleed a little bit, and it's kind of painful, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, however, if you do want to avoid that happening, what I would highly recommend is when you go into the when you go to the beach and you're going in the water, uh, especially if it's a sandy beach. Uh, what you want to do is when you're entering the water, you want to shuffle your feet back and forth rather than stepping your feet up and down, because uh, when you shuffle your feet, you'll tend to kick the side of of one of these and they'll swim away. Whereas if you step on top of one, then it's going to sting you with its with its little barbs. Uh, so shuffle your feet when you are going into the ocean in California, because there are lots of skates uh, at the sandy beaches in California. Okay, the last group of fish I want to talk about are the bony fishes, uh, what are known as the osteichthys. Uh, so, so this word osteichthys, it literally translates to bony fish. So if you think of this prefix uh, oste, uh, if you think of a condition that sometimes people get osteoporosis, Osteoporosis is a condition of the bones when your bones are, are kind of porous. So oste means bone. Uh, ichthys, I taught you a little while ago, means fishes, like an ichthyologist is a person that studies fishes. So osteichthys means bony fish. Uh, and so of these bony fishes, there's quite a few species. There's uh, roughly 31,000 species of them. Uh, there's way more types of bony fishes than any other type of, of vertebrates. So they have skeletons made of bone, as I was saying. Uh, they have very flat, bony-like scales, either tenoid or cycloid scales, you know, different from the kind of toothy scales that uh, the cartilaginous fishes have. Uh, unlike cartilaginous fishes, they have what are known as homocircle tails. So the prefix homo means, means the same. So the upper and lower lobe of the, of the fins of a bony fish will be identical. They'll be very similar to each other. Okay, fishes have a, a bony operculum. That is this hard plate right there. Uh, and that covers the, the, the gills and protects the gills of, of this fish. Uh, and typically fishes, how they reproduce is externally. Uh, so they don't have uh, internal fertilization like us. In general, what they do is they fertilize externally, meaning that the, the male and the females, they just kind of uh, squirt out their eggs and in, in sperm into the water. Uh, sometimes the females will lay their eggs on the seafloor and then the males will squirt their sperm over the eggs. But typically it happens outside the, the body. Uh, this little fish right here, this is what's known as, as a splendid toadfish. This is one of my, my favorite types of bony fishes. Uh, because they have these really beautiful black and white stripes uh, and because they have one of the goofiest faces I think of any fish uh, and they just kind of sit underneath caves uh, uh, or sit at the entrance of caves uh, only on the island of Cozumel in Mexico. That's the only place they're found. Okay, so there are uh, a couple of there. There's a couple of different types of bony fishes that I want to talk about. Uh, the first one are the ray finned fishes. Uh, and so these are the typical fishes that you would think of. So trout, tuna, salmon, uh, rockfish, uh, swordfish, marlins, things like that. They are ray fin fishes. Uh, and what I mean by ray fin fishes is that in each of their fins, uh, there are bony rays that extend through them uh, that give the, the support to those fins and give those fins their rigidity. Uh, so that's what ray fin fishes have. Uh, and ray fin fishes include, you know, a lot of the fishes that you would normally think of. So like this lionfish is a ray fin fish. Uh, this thing is what's known as a boxfish. Uh, it is also a ray fin fish. This is a uh, frogfish. Uh, it may not look like it, but it is actually a ray fin fish. This cute little thing, so this is uh, what's known as an anemone fish because it lives inside of anemones. Uh, it's ray finned. These are what are known as damselfishes. These particular ones are known as humbug damselfish. Uh, they are ray finned. This is what's known as a hawkfish because it has a long kind of beak almost thing, kind of like a hawk. Uh, so it is ray finned. 
Uh, and then finally, everybody's favorite fish from Finding Nemo, clownfishes, they too are ray finned fishes. Okay, so the ray finned fishes are in contrast with one other group known as the lobe finned fishes. So with these fishes, instead of having uh, bony rays uh, inside, of their, uh, inside of their fins, uh, their fins are made up of these kind of fleshy sort of protrusions. Uh, it's more kind of like a hand or an arm uh, than, uh, than a bony ray. So this includes things like lungfishes, and it includes this group of fishes known as coelacan. Uh, and fishes are really important to us uh, because this is who we evolved from. So the lobe fin fishes gave rise to what are known as tetrapods. Uh, the prefix tetra means four and pod means foot. So they gave rise to all of the four-legged animals that walk around on land. So the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, lobefin fishes are the ancestors of all of those different groups. Uh, and there's a particular uh, uh, extinct animal known as Tiktaalik, uh, which is what you see in this picture. And Tiktaalik is kind of like a part fish, part amphibian. Uh, it was a Tiktaalik was discovered or fossils of it were discovered about 20 years ago. Uh, and it provides a crucial link between the fishes and the, the four-legged things that walk around on land. Uh, so this is kind of an in-between state between amphibians and fishes. So the coelacanth, as I, as I showed you before, they, they have this, uh, uh, we, we see them in these, in these fossils, uh, and so they are extinct. No, just kidding, they're not actually extinct. But there's a good story about that. So they were thought to be extinct for a long time. Uh, so for a, a while, people only knew about coelacanth from the fossils of them that they would find. But then it turns out in 1938, a fisherman actually caught one in South Africa. Uh, so this fisherman caught this coelacanth uh, and they said, you know, what the hell is this thing? So they brought it to a museum and the museum curator who happened to be an ichthyologist saw it and realized what an incredible thing that fisherman had caught. They had caught a, a coelacanth, which were presumed to be extinct. So we now know that obviously they're not extinct. Uh, and there are two different species of them that are, that are typically found in pretty deep water. Uh, so like this picture here, uh, where, where this, this scuba diver, this is in a few hundred feet of water. Uh, that scuba diver is not me. I'm not qualified to do dives like that. Uh, maybe someday, but definitely not now. But there are people that can dive down to where coelacanth are found. Uh, but in general, we, we typically only see coelacanth uh, when they're caught uh, or see them in some, uh, with submersibles because in general, they live too deep for people to scuba dive down to. Uh, so those are the coelacanth. Uh, and that's all I have to say about the different groups of fishes. Uh, so in the next, uh, in the next uh, uh, video lecture, I uh, will get into the second part of chapter eight, which is going to be looking at the different properties of fishes and what it's like to actually be a fish uh, and live as a fish.